terms of gatherings to 50 indoors and 100 outdoors. And we are hoping that as we work together with our law enforcement agencies, I did see how then as well, we were talking with the premier, um, we saw a lot of people going out in terms of um, the law enforcement to assist us, but it has to take many people who are actually responding to a message like we've seen previously. Now, the message that I'm saying to South Africans, especially those that, for example, are not adhering, is that you are risking not your life, but you are risking the lives of your loved ones. You are risking those that you stay with, your colleagues and your friends, because when you go to a protest march, for example, uh, it's chanting, it's running, the observation of the protocols, literally you see some people running without the mask as well, some people almost destroying properties, burning tires. In the process, you are sharing these things and you're holding these things in your hands from one hand to the other. And that's putting a risk to other people. So we are appealing to Houghton residents who are currently every day, I saw on the 16th yesterday as well, are not dropping in Houghton. You are seeing community spread in terms of the virus. And we really want to appeal that can we also respond, save the lives of many South Africans in your province and also assist us because the health practitioners are starting to be under pressure. What we have done from our side is that we've started to work together with the province. Uh, yesterday, we, after the conversation with the president and the minister of defense and military veterans, we have requested additional capacity to assist Houghton in terms of military health that has moved into the province to assist us swiftly. And I want to appreciate the minister together with the defense military health who have responded swiftly when we called them yesterday afternoon to say, please come and help us in Houghton. What this will do, will be able to release the capacity of the beds that have been held because there were no human capital. So they will assist us in terms of moving into the hospitals, into the areas where we need healthcare practitioners to assist us in managing, because in terms of the beds, you have to have the human capital that is linked together with the beds that we are making available for managing the pandemic. The second area they will intervene and assist us is around mass testing and mass screening in community, and also the contact tracing they will be able to assist us in terms of that, moving into Houghton. So we are zooming into Houghton, and today we are finalizing because the province has also asked us to help them in terms of ensuring that we can bring uh, capacity in terms of the Department of Health. I've had a discussion with Minister Mtunu, who is assisting us that we should be able to conclude that today. So yesterday, we were able to agree with the Minister of Military of defense and military veterans for the deployment of the military health into Houghton, which will start from today as per our discussion, so that we can be able to help the process of ensuring that we ease the burden of um, the health workers in the province where they are seriously under pressure. And this you understand maybe one of the things that I need to reflect on is that other pressures are brought by you. Remember that the Charlotte Matlake Hospital, which has had, uh, in terms of bed capacity, it's got 1,000 that currently is not available for us to utilize because it was evacuated. There's been discussion between ourselves as national department and the province together with the municipality to ensure that we can comply and bring back the uh, hospital back to functionality. The process is underway. We are hoping that in the coming weeks, uh, the engineers will assist in terms of finalizing the work and also giving the certification for occupation of the hospital so that we can be able to see that coming back into life. But that will not deter in terms of the work that we have done, redirecting the uh, bed capacity in Houghton, redirecting the um, ensuring that, for example, if you would have seen the circular that went out in terms of having to say to the, uh, to the health practitioners and to the hospitals to say, non-critical and non-agent surgeries will have to be postponed so that we can pay attention to what needs to be done now. Another area that we want to talk about is to be able to give in terms of um, the recovery rate that has steadily at 95% and 
And I think in terms of the MEC, the colleagues will be able to go into this. And also the exciting news yesterday at 10.31, we were able to pass the 2 million mark in terms of vaccination. This at 10.31, the person that passed the 10 million mark, uh, 2 million mark that helped us at 10.31, it was at Simonia Clinic in Western area. So we were counting because we are monitoring life in terms of the activities of the vaccine rollout. And this is good news because when you look at what we are dealing with in terms of ensuring that we can build immunity, the higher the number we are able to vaccinate of our population, the better we'll be able to manage the pandemic. And we should not also think that when we're saying that uh, you are going to vaccinate, you are going to people should not lower their guard and stop protecting themselves by wearing their mask and social distancing and also sanitizing. This is to ensure that by the time we reach immunity in terms of the community, in terms of the entire South Africa, at least we have managed to protect the lives of those that are most vulnerable currently. That's where we are focused. Dr. Crisp will go into details about our vaccine rollout. Other good news, we have been able to talk about the president announced the 300,000 a vaccine that would arrive. I can confirm that that happened yesterday at, on the 17th of June. At 17.45, we received the consignment that arrived in the country. And Dr. Crisp will go into detail because that has been identified uh, as well to assist us for the teachers in the country together with other frontline in terms of police. Uh, he will go into detail in terms of the preparation that is being done around the area. I think the other issue that is important, you'd remember that when we talked about the phase two of the vaccine, we primarily pro, uh, proposed or put in terms of the plans that would have firstly uh, the senior citizens or what we would call 60 plus uh, population. And in this, because it was understood that in the 60 plus population, majority of them would have comorbidities and therefore becomes our, or are vulnerable more. And that's why it was critical for us to start with them. We have wanted to vaccinate in terms of our population of that category. We have more than about around 5.5 million. Uh, currently, we are not really doing well. I must be upfront about it in terms of registration and vaccination. And we are looking at mechanisms to be able to intervene so that we can fast track. One has gone through the research reports that has been proposed uh, uh, produced by HSRC together with UJ, and the other one was released this year as well, just after March, uh, by UJ, where they were studying communities to understand their response to vaccine. And also they were doing work that they wanted to understand whether communities are buying into our vaccine program, whether there's concerns about from communities. And one of the things that has come sharply out of the reports is the issue around cost to our sites. Our intention is to make sure that the sites, the vaccine sites are closer to the community. So the vaccine must go to the people, not people going to the vaccine. So an example of this research, they've done a deep dive into, the researcher went to, for example, into whether they've been able to register those who are 60 plus, what are their issues, and how do they recommend for us to be able to respond? This is important because when we respond in, in, in what they've raised, this is based on the research, as we have said as government, that it will be evidence-based. Now you go and look into that. One of the issues is that a person who is in Protea South have to go to Lens Clinic to be able to vaccinate. For you to go to Lens Clinic, it's two taxes and 44 rands at a cost. This is one of the things that as we work this week, going to next week to IMC, we'll work around the clock to respond to that in terms of increasing of the sites um, that we have to pay attention to, making sure that our response responds to making that the vaccine comes to the people, not that the people have to, because that's what we understand. If you understand the logic even around the senior citizens, it means when I have to have about 50 rents, for transport, meaning that the senior citizen will have to wait for the payday when they receive their grant to be able to go to vaccinate. In registration, I think we've been able to respond well, very well because we've gone into the communities in terms of door-to-door -to, -door to register them 
and the researcher is able to identify and has been able to meet some of the people who've gone into the door-to-door -to, -door to register. We go to pay points in terms of SASA to register them. We go to the malls to register them. And one of the things that in terms of vaccination, we have to respond is to be able to find mechanisms where we do the similar way of going to the people in terms of vaccinating. But the colleagues who are here from MEC, both um, Professor Reef, Reef, Reef and, and Professor Schwab, uh, Schwab will be able to assist us in terms of going into the details around what we need to do. I think the other thing in terms of what we are doing, uh, uh, colleagues will be able to take us in terms of the piloted size. We have previously talked, even we have had economic cluster requesting that economic activities have to come back in terms of life, being able to work uh, properly and assist us in terms of saving lives and livelihoods. One of the pilots that we had to do during this time was to be able to assist um, and do a pilot. And Dr. Berry Kisnesami will go into the details in terms of our occupational health as our occupational health expert in terms of the work-based vaccination system, testing site, which has been piloted, what is it that we can do in terms of rolling out? Because one of the things that we are trying to do is to have a multifaceted approach in terms of the vaccine, making sure that everybody can be able to vaccinate properly. Um, and we do not have like a one system that does not respond to all the sectors, but also is, can be constrained and might not be able to respond to what we want to do. So if you look at that, you'd find that we've gone into, for example, the mining sector to look at how we can utilize that sector to be able to vaccinate those who work in that, in that sector. And the lessons that are learned will be shared in that area to be able to assist. I know many of people who've been saying that we are frontline staff in terms of the economic sector, and therefore for us to be able to operate, would we'll be able to, um, we need to have the frontline staff to be able to be vaccinated. As the Minister of Tourism, I would have previously talked about that in terms of the, those who are actually interacting with our travelers because they would have said that they are uncomfortable to interact with a travel, a, a maybe tour operators or tour guides who are not vaccinated. So that area would be able to be covered by Dr. Berikis Nasami to be able to say these are the lessons in terms of our pilot site and give us in detail how we plan to go and, and go forward. Um, we'll also go into the discussion around other uh, vaccines. I know many people have been asking questions about what is it that we are doing in terms of the vaccine rollout or even bringing more other vaccine around. Uh, many questions will be asked about Sputnik, about Sinovac, and all other vaccines that are available uh, in the, pop, in the uh, global platforms. How are we utilizing that? Because sometimes people think that We've just decided on two vaccines that are not really uh, assisting us to go forward in terms of broader work that we have to do. So the, the colleagues who are going to give us in terms of details, in terms of the vaccine, how the MEC does the work in analyzing the vaccine uh, acquisition in the country in terms of the recommendations, which vaccines would be suitable, because you'd remember um, South Africans that one of the things that we have to make sure is that the vaccine efficacy has to be in such a manner that it can help us to protect our country and protect citizens. So there's been previously, as Minister Mkiza previously would have briefed us, that there is a level of efficacy that we have agreed on that we need to be able to meet in terms of the vaccines that we get. But the process thereof, because there is an application process with the regulator, so if you are a, a pharmaceutical that has a vaccine in terms of operating in the country, the registration process, but also compliance with WHO requirements in terms of providing data that has been used in terms of the scientific analysis of the efficacy of the vaccine and it being able to respond. But also for us, it has to be able to respond and help us and it has to be effective against B.1. 0.351 variant that is in the country. So it's very important in that as well as we do the work that we are doing. So that is important for us to be able to get in terms of the details that we are working on. But again, as I conclude, I just want to say 
for the colleagues who are not in counting in terms of the regulations that have been issued. We have issued the regulations because people have said, some of the people have raised the concerns to say, no, we can't have the same restrictions that are applying in counting to the areas where there isn't a huge spread. We are saying when we look at the numbers, we are seeing an upward trend across the provinces. So that's why the regulation had to be applied across. That's why the entire country has moved to level three. And all of us have to be cautious because if we do not contain currently, what we are seeing coming up is likely to affect us all across the country. So it's important for us to be able to deal with this right now in detail, making sure that we can contain and utilizing the lessons from previously in terms of our uh, how we dealt with uh, level uh, wave one and wave two, or second wave, if we call it that way. So it's very important for us to be able to understand as South Africans the importance of us adhering to the um, message that has been sent. We know that you are tired in terms of being in your houses, but right now it's not the time to lower your gut because you could be compromising your loved ones, you could be compromising your colleagues, and we are urging those that there is, if there is no need for you to leave your house, please stay in the, in the house, go out to do what is absolutely necessary because we have to weather the storm right now of the third wave, and we can only do that with your help, with your support. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister, and uh, let us all heed the call to adhere to the non-pharmaceutical interventions. Thank you, Minister, um, for that update. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Nicholas Crisp now to join us. Um, hi, 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 Dr. Crisp, I see you're ready. Uh, Dr. Crisp, uh, please, the floor is yours. Morning. Good morning, Minister, Deputy Minister, DG, colleagues, and uh, those participating in the seminar. Um, so I'm briefly going to outline what we are doing about the, the total rollout, uh, starting with, of course, what everyone knows, we began with the Sasanke trial and managed to vaccinate 479,000 people during that initial period. Since the start of the, uh, the main national rollout, which was on the 17th of May, we have now, as the minister informed us, crossed the 2000 vaccination mark. And uh, what has constrained us has been the lack of availability of vaccines. Um, all the provinces and the private sector uh, uh, providers have been champing at the bit to open additional sites. And as we know, if we want to get closer to the people, we need more sites and we need more vaccine. The situation at the moment is that uh, that process will continue to roll out. But we are um, fortunately now received the 300,000 doses that we have been looking for, for bridging the J&J &J, uh, conundrum that we had when the FDA uh, locked up vaccines. And we will immediately start rolling out uh, two programs and followed by others. The first one is the education sector. Altogether in that sector, there are 582,000 people, that's the public and the private edu basic education sector, including all those employed on first cell, the SGBs and the private uh, educators. Uh, many of these people are, uh, have already been vaccinated, some because they're over 60 and some because they work as psychologists and others who are registered as healthcare workers. But the majority of people obviously still need to be vaccinated. The program is designed to, uh, with a major thrust that should be over within 10 days, 10 working days, and all the provincial health departments and provincial education departments are going to focus on um, vaccinating educators in this period. The 300,000 doses will obviously not be enough to complete all of that sector, but fortunately the next consignment of vaccines due next week. It's also from a similar source in the United States, and um, it is also on a short expiry date, which is why we are accelerating this program over such a short space of time. Um, the, the Department of Basic Education is organizing that schools, the, the staff of the schools go to the designated vaccination sites for this program and will be arranging transport to enable them to get to those specific sites. It's a, a very specific program. It's not the normal program for the general community. And um, we're just asking teachers and the other staff in the education sector when they go, when they're called, 
uh, to the vaccination site to, to remember to take their ID documents and their medical aid if they are a medical aid member. The second major program that is now in an advanced stage of planning and will roll out pretty much immediately upon completion of the teachers is the security cluster, starting with the police services, which planning is in an advanced stage. Um, the, the South African police services working together with Polmed and GEMS. About 145,000 people are covered through the Police Act and a further 36,000 through the Public Service Act. Those are the civilians working in the, in the police services. And all of those people are targeted. There's slightly different programs for the two of them because of the, the uniformed or the Police Act people being dealt with in a particular way. So there will be um, sites at uh, police stations. They are working together with um, pharmacies who have licenses and are designated points for the delivery of the vaccines. And there's a service provider working with the South African police services for vaccinating members. And there's a service provider working with the Department of Public Service and Administration and GEMS for the, the other workers. Finally, there's also a program that is rolling at the moment for the South African Defence Force and for correctional services. The, each one of them has got a different set of needs. Uh, the Defence Force are clearly the uniform members in terms of the Defence Act. And fortunately, the Defence Force has its own military health services, so they will be vaccinating their own members. Whereas in the corrections, the, the inmates will be vaccinated through the public, uh, through the correction services, but the staff will be vaccinated through the same program that is run by the Department of Public Service and Administration with GEMS. So I think uh, maybe I should stop at that point just to say that there are a lot of parallel processes in terms of the volume of vaccines we have, will have, besides the Pfizer vaccine that we already have in the country, we will have an additional 2 million doses in the short term. And by now, the uh, Johnson & Johnson deliveries will, will recommence so that we can continue with the program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nicholas Chris, for the news that we are prioritizing our frontline workers. Dr. Barry Kisnesami, um, we will give the floor to you as you're ready to share your screen. Um, thank you very much. The floor is yours. Morning, uh, Minister, Deputy Minister, DG and colleagues, and to the participants in the webinar. Uh, so I'm going to quickly look at the issues on the workplace delivery and uh, basically just stop my video for bandwidth purposes. And Chair, I take it that the slides are showing? Thank you. Yes, we can see the slides and it's in slideshow mode. Thank you very much. Thank you. So. As ministers pointed out, we are looking at the issues around the workplace uh, delivery mechanism. And just to remind colleagues that um, on the webinar that uh, we essentially phase one was on healthcare workers as a special category of workers. And then phase two starts with the general population and then what we call the rest of the work workforce in terms of occupational services. The unique feature of workplaces is while the general population is operating at 60 years and above in terms of uh, starting with uh, older persons, uh, the workplace population is an uh, age band of 40 years and above. Uh, just in terms of some of the data on the workplaces, we have 15 million workers in the formal economy and 7 million in the informal economy, like the waste recyclers, street traders, um, the taxi sector. For the purpose of this presentation and the workplace interventions, we have uh, segmented the taxi sector, which does a considerable amount of work in terms of transportation and has both uh, risk to themselves as the taxi sector, these are the taxi drivers, the uh, marshals at a taxi point, the conductors, etc., as well as possible transmission risk to, to, to the commuters that go in the taxis. So that's the only grouping we've carved out. But I'll talk a bit more on the, the formal economy, which we split into the public sector. And Dr. Crisp has spelled out that there are some unique features that are covering the public sector and elements within it, like the uniform services. And then the private sector is split into large and small and medium enterprises because the unique features affecting these. Many of the large sectors have got uh, strong occupational services, uh, particularly mining, uh, large parts of the auto and manufacturing sectors. But the small and medium enterprises uh, really have virtually no services uh, in terms of workplace delivery of services. 
and uh, Dr. Crisp has co covered the special program covering health workers, basic education, security cluster, and the public service. So we've uh, there have been many questions asked about sector prioritization uh, because we can't start on day one with a certain sector as we use the health workers. So we use a two by two matrix to look at contribution of gross domestic product and social impact, as well as risk of disease and severity, risk of death and severity of disease. So that was the two by two table. And uh, we came up with some segmentation of which sectors to start first in a vaccine constrained environment. Uh, similarly, colleagues in the trade union movement did some work and the top right hand side uh, highlights some of the sectors. This is risk of transmission of infection in terms of what are called frontline workers in many instances. And you can see education is up there, police and correction services, retail sector, underground mining, et cetera. So just to remind colleagues, we're starting with the age-based sequencing in the workplace, uh, starting with 60 years and above and move to 40 years and above, which is still in phase two. And the numbers in terms of the formal sector, we have about 416,000 workers above 60 years of age and overall between 40 and 60, 4.8 million workers. So that's what we are concentrating on within the occupational health and service work stream. Uh, we've made some breakthroughs. Uh, uh, th there is the issue about individual registration on the EVDS, but in terms of workplace sites, there'll be bulk uploading of the workers onto the EVDS, of course, after being consented either by the HR uh, human resources department or the uh, health professionals that might be in the workplace. But scheduling of vaccinations will be internal to the workplace site going by the age band. So bulk uploading is 18 years and above, but scheduling for the vaccinations will follow the age bands. We also have a reimbursement model uh, covering workers on medical aid. There's been a lot of queries about the medical aid funds, but this is a prescribed minimum benefit and there will be recovery of uh, funds uh, for the vaccinations, the vaccines and the vaccination administration uh, from the medical aids and workers not on medical aid will be covered by the National Department of Health. The Department of Employment and Labor has also set up a compensation fund for uninsured workers, and we're currently having discussions with them about uh, how to access that funds. And uh, members, uh, uh, colleagues might know that the Department of Employment and Labor has uh, uh, gazetted a direction uh, last week on vaccinations in the workplace. So site selection is dependent on vaccine supply, uh, uh, vaccine type, uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer. For now, we are using uh, Pfizer, but for certain workplaces, uh, Johnson & Johnson will come through, especially the basic education sector, as Dr. Chris has pointed out. And there are certain infrastructure requirements like the cold chain and uh, social distancing and inputs. And essentially, the team that's been working has looked at number of workers uh, by vaccinators, giving us high throughput sites. Uh, not everything going to one sector in terms of uh, the delivery mechanism, also not uh, companies in only one province, so geographic location, and then lastly, site readiness to provide vaccination services. So the chair has mentioned the pilots with the minister. So we started one mining sector on the 24th of May in Northwest, and uh, they vaccinated about 2,000 workers today, starting with age bands 60 and above. One manufacturing in Kauteng started on the 5th of June, and they have done about 700 to date, starting slowly but ramping up. One state-owned enterprise will start next week in Mpumalanga, and I think you'll see that we are trying to actually do some uh, distribution by sector as well as uh, province. Uh, one informal, the taxi sector, starting next week in Kauteng, and uh, experimenting with the public service uh, in terms of the Office of the Premier and the Department of Health in the Western Cape, notwithstanding the special program for the public service, but there were some unique circumstances that will pull this together. So one of the issues we've learned in terms of uh, the two sites that have started rolling out is there is a fair amount of vaccine hesitancy amongst workers. So we're working quite hard to find out the reasons for the vaccine hesitancy and inputs on that, notwithstanding substantive work being done on what are called closed sites, because we have a captive population. Workers come to work every day and we can deliver services and we can actually counsel with them because we've got uh, uh, health personnel that can actually deal one on one, similar to other places as well, but particularly in workplaces. Uh, in terms of the next month, uh, we're planning 145 sites in terms of the rollout. You can see the bulk in mining because uh, they've actually had quite substantive uh, occupational health sites. Uh, we've then tried to look at some of the other sectors as well. And this is also provincially, geographically uh, distributed, uh, notwithstanding the, uh, the, the sector prioritization process. 
So in summary, uh, Chair, uh, we are working with Business for South Africa and NEDLAC. So all the discussions we've had, the site selections, the information provided has gone through these structures as very important governance structures. We have finalized the model for site selection by sector, geographic area, numbers of workers and site readiness. And we currently are in working through 145 workplace sites to continue to move forward in terms of delivery of vaccinations through workplaces. Thanks, Chair, and over. Thank you so much, Dr. Kisnesami. Um, thank you. You can um, take down your presentation um, so that we can allow uh, Ms. Wormerans to come through. Uh, after conducting some social listening exercises, we asked Ms. Wormerans to come through and just um, talk to the public about troubleshooting EVDS issues. Uh, we're just going to... Um, thanks, 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 Dr. Kisnesami. Thanks, Milani. Then the floor is yours. I see you already. Thank you. Um, good morning, um, Minister, Deputy Minister, the Director General, um, colleagues, and um, the webinar participants. I think the electronic vaccination data system um, is on everybody's um, minds these days. So I thought it well just to give an, a brief overview of the electronic vaccination data system, demonstrating that it's actually bigger than just the registration and allocating individuals to um, a vaccination site. So the electronic vaccination data system of the South African government has been designed and developed to actually support the full matrix of events of the vaccination program. So that said, there's many components to the electronic vaccination data system. And um, these um, components include the first one, which most of the public and yourself are most probably interacting with at this stage, is the registration one, where individuals that um, opt in um, are registering themselves. And I'll just talk a little bit more about the registration just now. Um, and then there's also a component where we are linking individuals with a vaccination site. Um, and I will also just give a, a brief overview of that. But then there's also a component where we are ensuring that every vaccination site is actually complying with the legislative requirements to be able to administer a vaccine and um, have got the required permits and that we know where each one of these sites are and also what the capacity in each one of these sites are in terms of administering the vaccines. And then very important, there's um, another component of the EVDS, which is um, the on-site EVDS, where there's an electronic record um, being kept or captured of individuals that gets vaccinated. And um, therefore, we can um, have a record of who got vaccinated, which vaccine they've received, what batch number, when the vaccine gets expired, um, is it the first dose, is it the second dose, who actually administered the vaccine, um, and that's that's part of and um, form part of the EVDS. All of this information, we then, in an aggregated way, are doing the data analytics, and that allows us then to be able to provide on a daily basis data to the public and yourselves in terms of the number of people that's been vaccinated. But we also use this information for management decision making to look at where there are areas where there is um, a huge number of people that's registered, but there's not enough um, vaccination sites so that we can target new vaccination sites um, um, aligned to where the needs are for the vaccine. So if we just zoom into the registration now, um, just to say that um, in the beginning, you will recall on, on the 16th of April, 24th of January, then the 16th of April, we had the registration for the vaccination was mainly through the web portal and or was actually only through the web portal um, through the website um, vaccine.enroll.health.gov.za. In addition, we have added um, the option that you can actually also register through the WhatsApp and you can also register through USSD if you've got an analog phone. 
And all of this is at no cost to um, the individual. All of this has been zero rated. And then we also have um, options where we can assist individuals that doesn't have access to the technology. One of them is finding the toll-free number. Um, and the toll-free number is 08000299, where there is um, a call center agent that will assist the person to register. And then um, um, we also have at each vaccination site, the option where people can also be assisted to register. And these are some of the additional measures that we have put in place. Listening to some of the um, um, information that we are getting from the ground, we're also now working on translating the registration into um, four main languages so that we can make it more accessible to our people in terms of enabling them to, to register. <clears throat> so um, just to say that once a person has been registered, you we've got your record. So um, it's part of a database and it's all into one big database. So once you've been registered and you received your SMS and to confirm your registration, we basically are putting you in a queue and to assign you to a facility. Now, just to explain um, how the scheduling work, um, we have a team of people that every night, um, they start at midnight and um, they run through the um, scheduling system. And while we still um, um, are opening up sites on a daily basis, they, the, the system are being rerun to look at if there is a site closer where you can be assigned or um, monitoring how long the queue is of a person. So how it works, everybody that has been registered has been put in what we call a virtual queue. So they've been allocated to a vaccination site. Now, um, because of the fact that there's on a continuous basis, new sites that are um, opening, we need to, on a daily basis, run this to find to see if there is um, that a date or a site that's closer or within the same suburb that has opened. And therefore, if there's a long virtual queue and you need to wait a long time, then people can be allocated to the new site that has been opening. And therefore, we're sending out the messages only three days before um, it's your time and day for your vaccination. And this allows us to continuously um, bring up new sites, um, working on the virtual queues, so that we can ensure that people can get their vaccine as quickly as possible. Also, um, in terms of people have to travel long distances, um, as Minister has mentioned, more and more sites will, will, will come online, and then more and more um, um, we can um, schedule people closer to, in terms of the indication of, of the suburb of where they are staying. So first of all, we look at the vaccination site and the capacity of that vac vaccination site in a specific suburb. If we see that that queue is very long, then we look at, is there possibly another suburb that's close by that's got a close, uh, the shorter queue? And can we then allocate individuals to that specific one? And that sometimes leads to, to um, a case where people have to travel some distances, but we are continuously looking at how do we improve it because it's exceptionally important that we focus on access to the vaccine. And um, the system shouldn't prevent people of receiving a vaccine. And therefore it's a continuous process of improvement. Um, the one key thing that I just would like to ask is that we all work on informing people that they should focus on when they register or when you register somebody or assisting somebody to register, <clears throat> that you ensure that you capture the ID number correctly. ID number is a very, very important um, identifier that we are using throughout the system. And we really want to plea with everybody that you make sure that your ID number is correctly captured. The other key one that's important um, because we allow it, um, we use that to communicate and that is the cell phone number. So the cell phone number um, allows us then to inform that you have registered, inform where you should go for your vaccination, but also um, after vaccination, receiving a message um, to indicate um, your, that, um, that you have been vaccinated, 
um, also give you a specific, specific vaccination code through an SMS. And it also then three days um, post the vaccination would provide you with additional information around the vaccine and what you can expect um, after vaccination. So um, those are just the key issues that we are looking at. The last point that I want to make is just to say thank you for all the feedback that we are receiving. Um, it is important and just to say that every all the feedback that we are receiving we are looking at it and we are looking at how we can improve the system so that we can respond to the needs of the people thank you very much thank you very much uh, Ms. Lomorenz uh, for clarifying some of those issues and then for uh, really crystallizing uh, the EVDS for us again um I'd like to now invite um, Professor Glenda Gray, I did see her earlier, um, to talk to us about the Susonga study. Professor Gray, surely one of the most seminal studies done in the history of medicine. Please give us an update. Thank you very much. Um, and um, good, good morning, Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister, DG, DDG, and um, colleagues and the public. Um, I want to report back on the almost 480,000 healthcare workers that we vaccinated. So what we are seeing um, from studies coming from all over the world is seeing good durable immune responses from the single jab. Um, we see good T cell immunity and the kind of side effects we see are similar to other parts of the world and similar to other vaccines. And so there's no, no real difference that we've seen. Um, these vaccines, whether it's the J&J or the Pfizer, will reduce your risk of severe disease. And um, they may not protect you from, from infection, but they do uh, protect you or reduce your risk from severe disease. And so we are following up all um, healthcare workers that have had breakthrough infections, and we're busy adjudicating them to make sure we, they, they, we, we can understand whether they're mild, moderate, or severe. At this moment in time, as we clean up the data, we are seeing a handful um, of severe infections, but only but most of them have been mild. Most of the breakthrough infections have been mild, and only a handful have been severe. Um, every breakthrough infection that we see, um, we do do a genotype on to see which variant um, has caused the breakthrough infection. And most most of the breakthrough infections have been due to our beta variant. And so it's very important for us to continue to evaluate that. Um, uh, as you know, the, in, at a global level, people are exploring boosting of the initial or primary vaccination series, and um, in, and we think that the optimal time to boost a, 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 a vaccination series would probably be around six months with the A26. So we're going to be exploring um, with other other vaccines, and the first one we'll explore is an A5 vaccine boost, and this will happen towards the end of the year, where we'll explore um, boosting the, um, the single jab, J&J. &J. So that'll be an ongoing work that we'll be doing with the regulatory authority and ethics committees in South Africa. At this moment in time, we're also doing a lot, a lot of sub-studies uh, with the single jab, J&J, um, &J, looking at um, HIV-infected healthcare workers, pregnant women, lactating women, and healthcare workers with comorbidities to try and understand the immune response that we see in South Africa and make sure it's comparable to all parts of the world. We're also very interested in coagulation and coagulopathy. We want to make sure we don't, have, we want, we don't see um, anything that's untoward. And so we'll also be evaluating uh, coagulation factors um, when we do the jab to give us a bit more, a bit more information on thromboembolic events. So I'm going to just end now. Linda Gelbeck is also on. I don't know if she wants to say a few words. Um, we're very happy that, um, that uh, most of the breakthrough infections have been mild and we do see an impact of this vaccine on reducing the risk of severe infection. And the gal, I'm not too sure if you wanna say anything. I think that's great, Linda. Thanks so much. <clears throat> um, thanks, thanks, Professor Gray. Please don't go away yet. Um, Professor Gray, there's a lot of medical jargon that we might um, understand amongst us, but I guess what people just wanna know is during the third wave, are our healthcare workers who are still working in the front line who have been vaccinated protected? So we see a good immune response, which is durable. So that's an important thing. We can see good T cell immunity and good binding and neutralizing antibodies. And we and we see that even if there are breakthrough infections, um, this, this vaccine has reduced your risk of severe or critical disease. And so our healthcare workers will, will have a reduced risk 
of getting severe disease. We still believe that healthcare workers must use their PPE, they must use masks, they must wash their hands, they must adhere to social distancing. A lot of infections that healthcare worker gets are community acquired. Um, and, um, and, um, and we have to make sure that, that while they're at the place of work, they have optimal PPE. And when they are at home, they protect themselves from community acquisition of, of SARS-CoV-2. Thanks. Thank you, Prof. Much appreciated. Thank you so much. Um, and finally, um, let us invite Professor, uh, invite, uh, Professor Helen Rees um, from SAPRA. Um, <coughs> Professor Rees, are you ready? Thank you very much. Um, please talk to us about what the other vaccines from the East and the West, from Cuba, and what's happening with those. Thank you so much. No, uh, thank you very much. And good morning, Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister, DG, my colleagues on the panel, and also the journalists who are sending questions through, so, and to the listeners. Um, so before I talk about those vaccines, and I know that there are real questions that, that we need to explain to people, and I'll get to that. I just want to explain something about how we are selecting vaccines and what the role of SAPRA as a drug regulator is and what the role of the vaccine MAC is at a very high level. And we have Professor Barry Shub, who chairs that committee also on this um, panel. So first of all, SAPRA is the drug regulator and the role of SAPRA is written into law. Um, and what we have to do in the case of vaccines is ensure that vaccines are safe, that they're of good quality, which means that they're manufactured properly and um, by the time they arrive in this country, if they've come for other countries, that they are still of a very good standard and that they're effective. The way that we look at effectiveness and safety in the first instance for a vaccine is to look at the clinical trial data that's presented to us. So the, the, the drug regulator doesn't itself do clinical trials. We depend on academics, on researchers, we've just heard Professor Glenda Gray, um, <clears throat> and the pharmaceutical industry who are developing some of these vaccines. We depend on them to generate the data which they then put into a dossier and they present to us. And they present a lot of information uh, from everything about what's happened in the laboratory, in clinical assessment, in the manufacturing process, and how they intend to monitor the safety once the vaccine is introduced that uh, the applicant applies for. The second thing is <clears throat> that, that SAPRA itself doesn't go out and look for vaccines. That's not the role of the regulator. But local applicants approach the regulator with an application, in this case, for a COVID vaccine. And from the outset, SAPRA has prioritized the evaluation of COVID vaccines. We have the CEO who's, who's really led the charge on this, um, but she's supported by committees of experts, academics, experts in vaccines, um, and also a, a staff who have been really dedicated to looking at all aspects of COVID and fast tracking it through the system. So every vaccine application that's been um, received has been fast tracked. So the, the question then is, what, uh, where are we with the applications? So the, so far, the vaccines that have been approved by SAPRA for emergency use is AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and J&J. &J. The vaccines that we have in the pipeline are the Sputnik vaccine and the Sinovac vaccine. Other vaccines that people have been asking about um, are not under review because we don't have an application for them. And so that's things like Novavax, um, Sinopharm, the Cuban vaccine that we've been hearing a lot about. Um, we don't have applications for those vaccines at the moment, so they're not under review. So let me talk about where we are with Sputnik and Sinovac, because those are the two that many people are saying, why does it seem to be taking so long that, that they are being under review? Well, it's actually not taking a long time. For the Sputnik, uh, the applicant, there are two applicants, and what they are doing is what's called a rolling review. So as they get data, they're submitting it to the regulator, and the regulator is is re um, reviewing that data on a continuous basis. And that speeds things up. That doesn't mean that you suddenly get a, a huge file of information that suddenly the regulator has to try and evaluate from all of those different perspectives. Um, but that really speeds, speeds the process up. They are still submitting some of that data. So we don't have all the data that's required for a complete review yet. <clears throat> so that's Sputnik. Sinovac similarly, 
when uh, they first applied, we needed more data. And so there's been ongoing dialogue with the Sinovac applicants, as with the Sputnik, in fact, as with all the applicants for these vaccines. It's not just a file that gets put on a desk. The regulatory authority talks backwards and forwards and says, we need this. Have you got that? Can you tell us more about this? It's an iterative backwards and forwards discussion that occurs with applicants. Now, the Sinovac applicants have now submitted to the regulator the same information as they have submitted to the World Health Organization. And many of you will have heard that the World Health Organization in the last couple of weeks gave what's called an emergency use listing for Sinovac. <clears throat> so we work as SAPRA with the World Health Organization. We've been in continuous um, contact with them. And in the last 48 hours, we have received uh, the, their dossier of evaluation um, of the Sinovac vaccine. It's still under embargo, but it has allowed the regulatory authorities, so the CEO and her team, together with these experts, are now looking closely at the WHO's evaluation of Sinovac. So that's going to help us speed up what we're looking at. But I, I want to say something very important um, about, uh, and it really builds on what uh, Professor Glenda Gray has just said. None of these COVID vaccines are 100% effective. Some in the early studies appear to be more effective than others, but none are 100% effective. The second thing is that none of these vaccines were initially developed to be effective against the variant, what we call the beta variant that we have circulating in South Africa. They were all developed against the original virus that came from Wuhan. And what we are seeing with all the vaccines to a greater or a lesser extent, <clears throat> that their effectiveness is altered by the, by the variant that's circulate, circulating in South Africa. What that means is they all appear to be somewhat less effective, but they do all appear to have activity against severe disease and hospitalization, which is very good news. Um, but not all vaccines are equal in this regard. And so we have to look at every vaccine independently and say, what is the information we have here? Do we, what do we think about the effectiveness of this vaccine in the context of the um, epidemic that we have in South Africa? Do we think it's going to work against our variant? So that comes to the, the next very important thing that the regulator does and is doing with the Department of Health and with specialized committees. And that is that after we introduce a vaccine, especially as all of these are new vaccines, that we monitor or what is happening in the general population with respect to this vaccine. In particular, we monitor looking for any safety signals that might not have been seen in the original clinical trials. So we monitor for safety signals. Is there anything that worries us? Not only in South Africa, but we're also looking around and working with the World Health Organization and other regulatory authorities, looking at safety signals that might be emerging worldwide, and then saying, is this something that could have been caused by a vaccine? How common is it? Is it very rare? And then how do we respond to it? But we also, because of our variant, and because we don't know how well some of these vaccines are going to perform in the context of um, our, our particular uh, virus, we are also, we're also looking at what we call effectiveness. So we're working with the MRC, with um, senior academics in the country to develop a national protocol that's going to monitor every vaccine that we roll out to say, how well is this vaccine working? Is it protecting? Are we seeing a lot of breakthrough infections? If we see infections, are they severe illness? Or actually, are we seeing that even if there are infections that we're reducing severe illness and death? And so we're looking now at how we are going to measure the effectiveness of those vaccines in that uh, in, in, in our context. So all of that's happening. So the regulator doesn't stop with just an approval. The regulator will be continuing to monitor effectiveness. Um, and lastly, there's another group that's very important, the, the Vaccine Ministerial Advisory Committee, and they have a slightly different role. While the regulator looks at safety, quality, and efficacy and is governed by legislation, the Ministerial Advisory Committee will also look at safety and efficacy, how well does the vaccine work, how well will it work in our setting against our variant. But they also look at things like how, how appropriate is vaccine A or B 
In terms of the program, does it need one dose? Does it need two doses? Does it need very, very cold temperatures? Is that going to be a challenge? And also, what is the price of the vaccine? And that dialogue, obviously, it takes place with, with a recommendation with the Department of Health and with Treasury. So um, this is where we are um, at the moment. And I, what I would say to everyone is watch that space. The requirements when we register any vaccine might well differ from vaccine to vaccine, um, but this is uh, where we've got to at the moment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Rees, for bringing us into your confidence. I think it's really important to understand the work that gets done by SAPRA. Um, we're ready to move on to our um, questions answer, answer session. But while we prepare for that, I just wanted to say that uh, Professor Rees, I was listening to you at a webinar not so long ago saying that, um, you know, it's, um, you know, when you go to a pharmacy or if you go to a hospital and you get a drip or if you get an over-the-counter medication, you don't worry about whether it's going to work or not. You don't worry about how safe it is. And that's because of the work of SAPRA. And we've never really um, dived into SAPRA as a, as a public. And um, this pandemic has actually really brought us into the inner workings of SAPRA. And so really we must appreciate that, you know, the work that is done by SAPRA gives us all peace of mind um, as we go out there and, uh, you know, we heal ourselves or, or in the case of us doctors, heal other people. I just wanted to make that observation because I thought it was a very interesting thing that you said at Thank that um, press briefing. Thank you, Professor Rees. Um, we're going to go on to the question and answer session. And with the minister's permission, um, I'm going to start with the questions that have come from our media colleagues. Um, and I think I will take five at a time, Minister. And um, of course, the minister does have a, a panel of um, officials, experts, that you can call on anybody that, you, that you'd like to, to maybe um, assist with those questions. But let me start with, the, with about five, and then we'll take it from there. Um, so we have a question from, um, my apologies. Uh, so let's start. We have a question from Angelo Coppola from CGTN. And the question for the minister is, please provide more details on why Charlotte Matvege is still closed over two months since um, the fire and when will it be reopened? We have a question from Alex Winning. And actually, this is a frequently asked question, uh, colleagues. Um, everybody wants to know what happens after June. They've all seen uh, with Pfizer, they've all seen the schedule for, Ju for, Ju uh, uh, for June. But then what happens in July? Um, can we maybe crystallize um, that schedule? Um, and um, his second question then is how many South African healthcare workers have been vaccinated in total, taking into account both the Sosongra protocol and immunization since phase two began? If we, if we have that data disaggregated, that would be great. Um, and then um, I think the third question um, comes from Sophie Mugwen at SABC. Um, the Solidarity Fund and Treasury paid for uh, procurement of vaccines through the COVAX facility. When is South Africa going to receive its first consignment from COVAX? And um, question two, how long does it take for the regulators to process requests for vaccine emergency approval? I think, um, I think uh, Professor Reese has covered you, um, uh, Sophie. I, I, I hope that she has. Um, and then let's take maybe two more. Uh, Nathan Giffen from Groundup uh, is adding to, okay, yes, that, that frequently asked question on the Pfizer. And um, are we counting six doses per vial? He just wants to confirm. Um, because some healthcare workers are saying it's tricky to actually get that sixth dose out. And then um, the, the last one is Vendel um, from Ritus. Um, yesterday, Minister told lawmakers that there are 64 health workers who tested positive in the last seven days. Are any of these um, uh, latest infections amongst health workers who have, received, um, who have already received vaccines or are they amongst those who did not receive vaccination? So I think Vendel, I think um, Professor Glenda Gray has covered us there. Uh, she has um, uh, talk, spoken about breakthrough infections, that there were a handful, that uh, there were healthcare workers, a handful of them um, were severe disease, and there was also some uh, one a couple who had uh, clots, although most of the breakthrough infections were minor. Um, then for Professor Rees, uh, this was a minister they did specifically ask Professor Rees to answer this question, is there any political pressure from government bring boards to bear and regulated to push through vaccines faster. And I think that she has covered us by saying that we are taking rolling submissions. Um, so we, that's really how we're trying to fast track the process. 
Uh, and then the next question is, in the pipeline of potential vaccine candidates seeking regulatory approval, uh, they, where would you place the Sputnik vaccine? Is it fair to say that because of uncertainty, especially regarding the second dose, potential impact on HIV infections in SA, the Sputnik is sort of last on the list because uh, so many, so much, I think they meant so much outstanding data. Is it fair to say at this stage that it is unlikely that Sputnik will be used in SA given these data gaps? So I think Professor Rees, maybe you can come back and talk about that ad five component and the issues that it poses in terms of um, HIV. But let me start with the minister. And uh, well, let's take it from there. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, Luazi, um, and thanks for the questions. I think let me start with the issue. I can now confirm by next week, uh, the oncology site at Charlotte Matraike will be handed over to start operating, which is phase one. And then once the phase two, we have a date, we'll announce together with the province. But I can confirm that work has been done. Um, it was based on what needed to do. I think the other issue, which has been a challenge, is around the doors that needs to be manufactured, the fire doors that needed to be manufactured, and that took longer to be able to get. Without those, the certificates would not have been issued. So now we get in that that has been sorted, they're being installed, and next week there will be, and the oncology part will be handed over. So we are not going to relax, we'll continue to talk to the province to assist us in terms of uh, making sure that we can be able to, to respond and get Charlotte Matraga back on track. We understand its importance in terms of um, its operation within the province. I, Loazi, we do have the deputy minister as well here. And I think um, in the panel of responding, um, if we could be able to allow him also to come in to assist in the responding of the questions around. That was what was directed to me as I picked up. And then I've responded to the issue of the intervention to Sokutu in the chat group. I don't know if you want me to say it directly here uh, while I'm here. In terms of the province, we've not received the in request for intervening in terms of the military uh, for or compliance regulation that will be in the security cluster. The request that we received was the health practitioners to assist with the capacity, and that has been responded to. Should the need arise for that, it will be done um, through the security cluster, not through SSI. Thanks. Thank you, Minister. Um, uh, Deputy Minister, um, Dr. Joe Pasler, I, I did see that the Deputy Minister is here. I just want to check with the Deputy Minister if there's any of the questions that. Um, the, the deputy minister would like to pick up. Uh, not now, not now, uh, uh, Loazi, you can pass, I'll come in later. All right, uh, thank you very much, DM, thank you. Um, right, let's see, um, I think if I can maybe ask um, Dr. Anban Pele to maybe just talk a little bit about the um, pipeline of Pfizer, and maybe you can also pick up the question on COVAX, uh, Dr. Pele. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mansi. Um, I think I'm having some difficulty putting my video on, but All right, uh, I'll keep my hand. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think on the in terms of the pipeline, you will recall that uh, um, the manufacturers had indicated to us that in the first quarter, that is uh, uh, of the of the year, meaning from uh, uh, January through to March, and then from uh, April through to June, their their uh, supplies will be fairly limited. And you would have noted that uh, over this period, we've uh, had very low uh, delivery of vaccine. However, from quarter three, which, uh, which starts basically in July, the quantities of vaccine that are going to be coming through are fairly significant, both from Pfizer as well as Johnson & Johnson. And uh, although there was the, the challenge relating to Johnson & Johnson around their supply in quarter two, I think uh, they have addressed that now, and we can probably see uh, quite significant doses of the J and J coming through in quarter three. Pfizer, as well as will be coming through towards the end of this month uh, so we will see 
a lot more vaccine uh, being available in quarter three. And I, I think you uh, then see our vaccination numbers increase significantly since our Thank you. I think we've, I think we we lost um, Dr. Pile. Um, Dr. Pile, maybe if if we can just try and improve the connection, we might bring you back. We heard you saying that Covax is is going to come at the end of the month, um, but we lost some of what you said before that. But but we will we will um, bring you back in a little bit later. I see the journalists are asking that you repeat your answer because we did not hear you well. But let's in the meantime, see if we can bring Professor Helen Reese back and ask Prof, uh, Prof, if you can just um, deal with um, that um, five component of um, Sputnik and then also um, Vendor still wants to know if you are getting any political pressure as SAPRA in, in terms of speeding up um, your um, ratification processes. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Both very good and <clears throat> appropriate questions. So I'm going to take the second one first. Um, and um, Lawazi, as you said, regulatory authorities um, have a very particular mandate, um, and it's often behind the scenes. And if you're working well as a regulator, as you said, you are reassuring the population that the medicines they get wherever they get them from are of good quality, they, they work for what they say they will work for, um, and that they are safe. Uh, so the, from the point of view of political pressure, the reason that regulators, including SAPRA worldwide, are governed by independent legislation is because it's very important that they're independent. Um, we can all recognize that departments of health, politicians, community advocates, many people will have very strong views on what they believe is, is going to be a good medicine, a good outcome, uh, the interpretation of, of clinical trial data, very strong views. And what you want is a regulator who stands to one side and independently says, does, it, does this drug work? Is it safe? Is it well manufactured? And can we monitor what happens when we roll this out? And does it independently? So what I can say um, is, that in terms of political pressure, the pressure has been about has, has been the country's pressure. It's to say we, as as with everyone else, the regulator couldn't do business as usual in the context of COVID. Everything that we haven't talked about, many of the other things that the regulator has had to have oversight for, has required urgent attention, creative thinking within the legislation, and everything has had to be fast-tracked. And that is true of the vaccines. And that is an expectation that the Honourable Minister would have, and that Parliament would have, and the Cabinet would have. In terms of reporting, we have reported to the Parliamentary Health Portfolio Committee and the Interministerial Committee on Vaccines. But what we have reported is the kind of thing that I've just reported on here, which is where are we in the pipeline? Explain why some things seem to be taking so long and so on. But at no stage have we had political pressure around vaccine A or B or C or D. I can say that with absolute certainty. In terms of your next question, it's a very good and a somewhat technical question. So the Sputnik vaccine is, is what we call a viral vectored vaccine. It's an adenovirus. And what that does is that that virus has been carefully uh, manipulated to carry a little bit of genetic material into the body. And that, and that combination tricks the body uh, and the body's immune system into think, into recognizing the COVID-19 virus. And that's how that vaccine works. Now, the Sputnik has got two adenovirus components. One we call AD5 and the other we call AD26. Um, <clears throat> they, they've, they've got, they're doing work on combining the two. That's what they've mostly done around the world. They also have another way of using their vaccines, which is called Sputnik Light. They have their adenovirus 26, their AD26 vaccine. But let me just talk about the, the challenge with the AD5. And we have discussed this with the Sputnik applicants. And worldwide, there is a discussion, including the World Health Organization. Uh, some time ago, and there was an HIV vaccine trial that was undertaken in South Africa called Pambile, and also in the United States called the STEP study. And this was an adenovirus, an AD5 vaccine, but to prevent HIV. And what was seen in those studies, both, both sites were stopped early because it, there was a suggestion that the, the, the vaccine with this AD5 vector 
might have increased the risk of HIV amongst men who were uncircumcised and who had antibodies already to adenovirus 5 that they got from the community. It's quite technical. Now, we don't know what to make of that in terms of the new generation of ad 5 vaccines for COVID. We don't know whether this is going to be a concern or not a concern. These are not the same vaccines. The way that that vector has been made, that ad 5 has been made, differs between a number of these, these ad 5 vaccines. So what we have done is we are working with the World Health Organization, who have an expert committee that is looking at this so that we can have some thinking about it. We've spoken to uh, the, the Sputnik manufacturers, and so has the World Health Organization. Um, and this is really being having ongoing thinking and a specialist committee on looking at all the vaccines with HIV has been set up by the Vaccine MAC um, and has also been looked at by SAPRA. So it, it is something that's definitely under review, but it's not nearly as easy as saying, we saw that in that study, therefore we will see that in this study with a different sort of uh, construct of that particular vaccine. Bit complex, I'm sorry, but, uh, but that's what's happening. But that's what regulators do. They pick up on anything that might be a safety issue and they ask those questions and they talk with the applicants. That's what we have to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Prof. Um, um, I'm uh, Dr. Pillay, my apologies. I don't know if we can get you back. And also, if you can just be brief, we do have another five questions. Then I'm going to close those out. Um, the questions in the Q&A, um, we will not be able to get to all of them, but I hope perhaps the um, panelists could perhaps assist and, and the minister and the deputy minister are welcome to also pick up any of those when they close out. Um, but um, Dr. Pillay, are you able to come back to us and, and just um, summarize what you said in the end there? Okay, I think we've lost Dr. Pillay. So what I will do then, uh, colleagues, the media... media um, oh, thanks, uh, okay. Dr. Vanzi, apologies. Hello, <clears throat> No, Dr. Pillay, I'm afraid that your Hello. connection is not great. Um, I think what, what what we'll do is that I will I will um, we will manage the, these with written answers, Dr. Pele, and, and we'll also see how else we can uh, maybe um, uh, publicize your answer as well. I think we must move on. We are running out of time, and we don't want to have set up broadcasters. Um, we, we we have another five questions which I, I really would love to to address, um, Minister, with your permission, and then we'll close out. Um, so is is that okay, Minister? Thank you. Um, so then I have questions from Dan Hawker at Newsroom Africa. Um, can you provide some clarity on the request for SNDF members to be deployed on, in Gauteng and when are expecting them to be deployed in which areas? And uh, any details on how many are likely to, de be, to be deployed and the duration? And her second question is the department mentioned that 145 workplace sites have been identified. What is the definitive start date, the date for the workplace vaccination? And Minister is welcome to ask Dr. Brett Sami to maybe um, go into that. Then um, in the next two weeks, there are over uh, 3.8 um, million vaccines expected to arrive. What is the rollout plan for these vaccines? Are they mainly intended for elderly South Africans? And will we see some of these going to the workplace sites? If so, please clarify the split. So that was Diane Hawker. Um, then I've got Heidi Jokos uh, at uh, ENCA. Why has the field hospital in Gauteng not been opened again, given the numbers the province is experiencing? We speak of military health helping, but can the minister please indicate how many beds will be made available, especially in Gauteng? The second question, should there not be further restrictions given the COVID numbers experienced, especially in Gauteng? The third question, Gauteng province has opened up uh, to walk-ins for 60 plus at all public vaccination sites, visiting a few, they seem empty, not as busy as before. Will other provinces also open up to walk-ins and are you worried you won't reach the 5 million mark to vaccinate uh, the 60 plus? Her fourth question, there are reports of a new variant emerging in Mauritius. Does health know about this and will there be restrictions? Um, I think maybe she meant to, uh, as in travel restrictions for Mauritius. And then uh, number five, can we have a breakdown of vaccines coming in? J&J &J and, how, and how many more Pfizer vaccines will we be getting? I think Dr. Pele was trying to do that. So um, if, 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 if you will allow me um, 
uh, Heidi, let's, let me send you a written answer on that one. Um, and then uh, Dan Hooker came back and said for Dr. Glenda Gray of the healthcare workers who did show severe illness after getting the j, &J jab, do they know how it is that this happened? Is it only a handful? Oh, sorry, it's only a handful, but it is worrisome that they show severe illness nonetheless. And considering that South Africa had to destroy 2 million j, &J uh, uh, vaccines produced locally, what um, are the current goals for vaccinations in SA by the end of 2021? I guess that will be for us and the department. Um, and then um, I've got two more. We're almost there. Two more um, colleagues. Um, good morning. Which variants, SA, India, and UK, are mostly responsible for the third wave? And what proportion in percentage terms do each account for? Is SA strain still the main driver of the cases? I think the short answer is yes, but we'll, we'll allow uh, somebody to answer that. Um, and then uh, lastly, from um, Muhammad Wadi from Muslim Stats, he say, international passengers arriving at Oral Tambo international airports, he says, are not being screened or asked to show their PC results or even required to complete the health questionnaire. We have noted visitors from India, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia arriving without any of these documents being asked for. Why is it that these conditions are not being strictly uh, adhered to? Um, uh, so I was hoping perhaps um, Ms. Annelisa Tzoli could be here, but we'll see. Um, thanks, Minister. That is, those, are, those are the last questions. Thank you. Let's request the colleagues to answer, and then I'll wrap up after everyone else. Um, Raj, do we answer, answer the question? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thanks. That is a very important question. So we know, as Dr. as Professor Reese has said, um, the B one three five or beta variant that we have in South Africa has reduced the efficacy of all the vaccines, and so we do expect to see breakthrough infections. So overall, there will be people that will um, will um, will have severe infections and there, there have been a handful of healthcare workers and a lot of these have had lots of comorbidities um, as well. They've been, um, have, have severe comorbidities. Every, every breakthrough infection we evaluate and we try and understand, you know, the timing of the, of the vaccination to the immune response to see whether, um, what was the cause of the breakthrough infection. But as, as, as we um, try and, and look at all vaccines, we do know that uh, we do have a reduced vaccine effect effectiveness because of our variants. So we do expect to see breakthrough infections. Um, and we do hope that all our breakthrough infections will be mild to moderate and not severe. And of the severe ones, there's usually a lot of comorbidities that's associated um, with a severe infection. And so we will continue to evaluate that and make sure that the um, that we understand um, the breakthrough virus and um, where, it's, where it's been circulating from. So thank you for that question. Thank you so much. Uh, Prof, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot here. It, would you be able to tackle the question on the variants in Mauritius? Yes, so I think that there's, there is investigations ongoing, and that's also the, the, the issue about choosing the right vaccine uh, for the right variant. And uh, Seychelles and Mauritius have been, uh, have been um, entities that have vaccinated, have, have vaccinated their populations to quite a high level and are still seeing breakthrough infections. And this could be because the variant, um, particularly the beta variant, which is a, the major circulating variant in Africa, um, has, has, has reduced um, efficacy against, um, you know, so, so what you're probably seeing is breakthrough infections because of the, the variant that's circulating. And most of the, the, the variant that's circulating in Africa is the B135 or the beta variant. And that will impact on the ability of the vaccine to to um, um, its effectiveness. Thank you, thank you very much, um, uh, Professor Gray. And actually, that is a very important point that you've made about the um, breakthrough surge in Seychelles and Mauritius. Um, and this is why it's so important for us to actually really tailor our vaccination uh, towards uh, the variants. Um, I think um, DG, if, if the DG is, is on, if DG can maybe um, tackle the question on how being in the field hospitals, um, restrictions, or, 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 or perhaps it, maybe the minister would have wanted to pick that up, but I'm, I'm just going to invite the DG in the meantime. Um, and then also perhaps um, on um, the allegations of what's happening at the border. I don't know if the, if the DG can is, is able. DG, Dr. Butelezi.
Okay, that's that's okay. I think um, we will. That's it's, I think uh, she he will we'll just maybe minister can can take that one later. Um, then I think um, there was the DG's here. Was ah, there we go. Thank you, thank you, DG. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Manzi. Uh, good morning, Minister, Deputy Minister, and colleagues. Um, I think on the Gauteng issue, we had a meeting about the field hospital, and one of the issues that we really picked up there was that um, the Nasrec hospital was not fully utilized. So actually then what needed to happen is that uh, the province, when the, the numbers were very low, it became very expensive to maintain the field hospital that is being underutilized. So that was the main issue. However, we want to assure the public that uh, what has been done in Gauteng, they've been able to repurpose a number of beds. So in terms of the report that we received this morning, they've been able to increase their beds by about 1,100 to ensure that they are close to 4,000 uh, to, to ensure that they don't run out of beds. So that's basically uh, what Gauteng has done. They've repurposed beds in um, uh, 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 in Procon Street, in Chris and Paraguanath Hospital, and in other hospitals around the province. And they've also worked with some of the former mining hospitals to get additional beds to reach that more than 1,000 additional beds in addition to the 3,000 existing beds uh, in the province. Well, the issue of the portals, we will need to investigate. I'm trying to get hold of our port health team to find out what's happening. But my understanding is that we've got very stringent uh, screening um, uh, procedures in place um, uh, at uh, our Tambo and the other ports of entry, because as we know that uh, the virus was initially imported into the country, so we are managing the borders very closely and in terms of the protocols, in the directions, and in the regulations that we put up. I'll probably stop there for now, Dr. Samans. Thank you very much. Thanks, DG. Well, I've got the DG. Would you mind tackling that question on which, which variant is, is predominating? I think people are worried that this wave is being driven by other variants. Um, but if we can just um, not reassure, but just clarify that which variants currently still predominates in this particular yes. wave. Yeah, no, no. Uh, the main variant, uh, according to our information that we have from our genomic sequencing team, is still the beta variant. Um, uh, which was first uh, discovered here in South Africa. It's still the main uh, 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 dominant uh, variant in the country. But I must mention that the, uh, um, the alpha and the delta variants are still there. Uh, the alpha being the original one and the delta, the one that was initially um, discovered uh, in India. They are there, but they, they've been maintained. So the beta variant is still the ma major one uh, that is still um, uh, uh, the, the driving force behind the infection in South Africa. But also in terms of... Um, uh, what I want also to assure the South Africans is that we have a very active surveillance through the genomic sequencing team that is actually looking at most of the positive specimen to ensure that we don't, uh, we, uh, we don't have another variant circulating that we are not aware of. So that work is ongoing uh, to ensure that we are able to, fire, uh, to pick up if there's any new variant that is probably driving um, the, um, the, um, uh, the infection. But for now, uh, we've not uh, discovered any through our genomic uh, sequencing team. Then let me quickly come to the issue of the vaccines. I know Dr. Pile was trying to respond to that one. Yes, um, in the third quarter, we are going to have quite a, a good supply of the vaccines. Uh, we are expecting uh, this uh, coming uh, uh, weekend to receive more than 1,200 uh, Pfizer vaccines. And then uh, uh, also before the end of the month, uh, the Pfizer vaccines, uh, those would be from our bilateral agreement that we have with, uh, uh, with Pfizer. But also before the end of the month, we're expecting to receive just more than 1.3 million uh, Pfizer vaccines through the COVAX facility. That's a question that was asked. So that one is, is uh, signed and sealed. We will be getting it. So we will be expecting uh, uh, 1.2 plus 1.3 of the Pfizer vaccines. That's quite a, a, a sizable amount uh, of the vaccines. But then in addition, as mentioned by Dr. Crisp and by the minister, the 300,000 is in the country, and we're expecting another 1.2 million Johnson & Johnson and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, in the next 10 days. So that would be able to also um, uh, give us a bit of comfort. Pfizer, we've written to them to give us a, another pipeline so that from July we are very clear on what is going to be supplied and, and at what particular time. So we are actually uh, um, uh, waiting for that, and we'll be communicating that once we've got something in black and white. 
in terms of how the supply is going to come. So uh, we think in the third quarter we'll be comfortable and our numbers are going to actually not even much, uh, 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 double and we'll be able to do uh, more than three times what we are doing. Thank you very much, Dr. Manz. Thank you so much. Um, then I think let's move to close. So um, uh, I think let's let's start with the Deputy Minister closing out, uh, Deputy Minister, um, and then we will invite the Minister to come back and give us final remarks and close out for us. Um, they, I know that there were there was a there were some specifics requested by um, Diane. Um, I think Diane, we covered you in terms of the 3.8, where we're going to be prioritizing, et cetera. And at the workplace sites, um, uh, Dr. Barry Kisnesami did give his presentation. Perhaps we can just engage on in some of the final details you might want to um, go into. But, um, but we do need to close out. And so may I please invite the Deputy Minister, Dr. Joe Pasha, to please, um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director, Dr. Manzi. I know that it's been a long morning. Uh, let me thank and pass my greetings to uh, my colleague there, Minister uh, Kubain Gubani, and all the panelists. Thank you very much uh, for very interactive and informative and, uh, inputs and discussions. Uh, indeed, there is no doubt that uh, our campaign has, over the last few months, the vaccination campaign has been impacted by a number of challenges. But we are very you know, encouraged by the fact that notwithstanding that, we, we have been able to be creative, to find solutions. Uh, thanks to our partners, the Medical Research Council of South Africa, uh, led by Dr. Glenda Gray and the JNJ uh, group for having come to the party and provided us with a stopgap measure through the Sisonke program, which has covered uh, quite a sizable number of our health workers. Uh, we know that uh, just through that program, we covered just under a, a, a half a million uh, health workers. Uh, since then, as has been indicated, uh, another uh, just over half a million health workers have had the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine. So a lot of progress has been made. Now, we're also thankful to the support of the private sector, civil society, and, and leaders of uh, community overall, churches, traditional leaders, because um, uh, this the vaccination program is just part of the safety uh, uh, of protecting our population. We still continue with all the other non-pharmaceutical measures for which we, we highly depend on the cooperation of society and, and leadership of, of, the, of the society have been very key in terms of us being able to, to realize that. And as far as the vaccination program as, uh, has been uh, elaborated by the various speakers, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Crisp, uh, Dr. Pile, uh, our uh, Professor Rees, and, 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 and Linda Gray, and others. Indeed, we, we are doing everything to make sure that we can roll out more and more vaccines, thanks to also the cooperation of our regulator, SAPRA, um, uh, for, for being very uh, supportive in, in attending to the regulatory matters. From our side, we're pulling all stops to make sure that we can uh, get as many of the available vaccines, notwithstanding the challenges, as we know, when we thought we would have received 2 million doses of the J&J vaccine, it just came out that there were uh, other challenges uh, in the U.S. where the, the basic ingredients are being manufactured. But we are thankful also that uh, notwithstanding that, as already indicated by Dr. Pillay and the, the DG, that uh, we have already received the 300,000 doses for teachers, and over the next uh, week, uh, we will be receiving further doses uh, of the JNG vac JNJ vaccine. So indeed, we want to assure the members of the public that we are pulling all stops to make sure that the public can be protected. What we need is just the support, cooperation, make sure that uh, more and more people, the over 60, as we open up to other sectors, the workplaces, that people come forward to register and, and be vaccinated. Uh, we, we, we are aware that it's a, it's, a, it's a major challenge in terms of reaching our targets. We are still hopeful with the many doses we'll be receiving in the third quarter and fourth quarter that we should be able to still be close to our target of January 2022 to have reached the 67% uh, of the population. I also just want to remind uh, our, our people that uh, uh, while we're doing all this to, to manage the COVID-19 and protect our people, 
we are not oblivious of the fact that we must continue to provide other services. Uh, Non-communicable diseases uh, such as uh, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, mental illness, uh, cancers, uh, all the, ca the cancers are still there with us. So let us all continue to use our health services uh, to make sure that we can protect ourselves. Uh, Corona, <laughs> Uh, let me leave it there, Program Director. I know it's been a long morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Deputy Minister. And finally, let us uh, invite back the Honorable Acting Minister to close us out. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, Dr. Loazi. Um, let me take this opportunity to thank all our panelists, our experts who joined us today to help us unpack what we are doing to the nation, simplify the issues and answer the questions. We'll continue this briefings to ensure that the nation is kept abreast with the issues that they've been raising with us. I think there's one thing that I need to clarify in terms of the um, uh, walk-ins um, that has come up. Um, one of the things that we have learned is that in the vaccine side, there are walk-ins. We do understand that we have issued a communique that says we do not encourage walk-ins, but we've picked up in some of the areas they are unavoidable. What we've taken as a decision is that we are going to develop protocols so that those that do necessarily end up doing walk-ins can understand what has to be complied with and for the health practitioners so that they can be able to know what to do. We do not want to see our vaccine sites becoming centers of the spread of the disease. So that's why it's very important that we have to develop these protocols, but we do understand the constraint in our social environment and our country that sometimes these are unavoidable. There are lessons that we are going to learn from some of the provinces in taking a deep dive in what they've been able to do to contain and manage their walk-ins. Just in conclusion, I want to reiterate to South Africans again, all political parties, all, all leaders in society, we urge you, we plead with you to assist us to fight the pandemic. Health practitioners, frontline staff can't do it alone. We need you all. To political party leaders, we do note that there is an issue concern some of the, you have been raising around the issue of the elections that you have to do your work. We do urge you to find the necessary platform to have these conversations, but don't risk the lives of your supporters. Don't risk the lives of your members. The pandemic, where we are now, we are in the third wave. The numbers continue to increase. And as we are monitoring across the country, no province can say it is safe right now. So we are urging you, as you do your work, please do so responsibly. To all leaders in our society, whether it's religious leaders, health practitioners, traditional leaders, traditional leaders, civil society movements, we need you to help us, youth organizations as well. We need you to help us to pass the message that we are in the third ways, and therefore we need to preserve lives and also urge people in communities to observe our non-pharmaceutical protocols by wearing their masks, by social distancing, by washing their hands and sanitizing, but also by avoiding gatherings. To those who are in the economic sector, our malls, our businesses, please ensure that your centers have necessary sanitizers. People observe social distancing and wearing their mask when they come. To our taxi industry, please, we plead with you, ensure that you adhere to the protocols. To the schools, Minister Musaha has issued a communique that no sporting activities in schools both private and public schools were urging to stop the sporting activities. We can all 
fight and win this battle when we work together. We continue to appeal to you, those restrictions supply. Those who are selling alcohol, please observe what has been issued in terms of the regulations. This you will be doing by preserving this economy, by preserving this country, by preserving lives and livelihoods. We thank you, South Africans, for continuing to work with us and supporting us through the health practitioners and all frontline staff. We appreciate you. We thank you for the dedication and support. We thank you for the sacrifices that you're making for this country, and we recognize you. Thank you very much, Loazi, and thank you very much to the broadcasters who are our partners, all media houses. We thank you for continuing to carry the message as we pass through to South Africans. Thank you, Minister. There's nothing further to be said. We close this press briefing. And with that, we come out of that briefing by the Acting Health Minister, uh, Mamulu Gobai Ngubani, uh, together with a panel of experts just giving South Africans an update in terms of how far government efforts are in the fight against COVID-19. And you heard her there pleading with different sectors of society, especially political parties, to come on board in the uh, effort of trying to stem this scourge. Let's take a look at your headline.